Krista Lewis, and um, up until last week, I was lead pastor of Village Houston, um, and it is an honor. I mean, I just can't, I can't say enough about how excited I am to be a part of Village Heights, and um, I have been a pastor for 20 years. I know, I don't look that, like I could do that. I just don't, um, but I have. And the Lord has just been speaking to me about a new season. And so I'm excited about being here and letting Bill and Hannah pastor me. And um, I just have to say, I am in love with Jesus. I get really, like Sarah Bessie says, she's all woohoo about Jesus. And um, she's an author that I love. And I am the same. I just, I can't remember a time when I didn't know Jesus when I didn't love him, and I get really excited about people knowing him and loving him, and not just that, experiencing the love and the the love and the grace and the knowledge that we have a Savior who is near, a Savior that knows what we've gone through and what we go through. And so um, I'm married. Um, I'm in the middle of our, we're in the middle of our seventh year of marriage. Ryan Beatty is my husband. Um, we have two puppies named Wicket. If you know where that name comes from, she does look like an Ewok. Um, and we have Remus, uh, who is named after Remus Lupin from Harry Potter. So that tells you a little bit about our lives. We are big nerds. Um, I love Doctor Who. And we, I love theology. And I love culture. And I love how God breaks in. And so this morning I want to pray for us, a prayer that was actually written for Advent, this season of Christmas, uh, by Walter Brueggemann, who's a theologian. So you join me in prayer. In our secret yearnings, we wait for your coming. In our our grinding despair, we doubt that you will. And in this privileged place, we are surrounded by witnesses who yearn more than we do, and by those who despair more deeply than we do. Look upon your church and its people in this season of hope, which runs so quickly to fatigue, and in this season of yearning, which becomes so easily quarrelsome. Give us the grace and the impatience to wait for your coming to the bottom of our toes, to the edges of our fingertips. We do not want our several worlds to come to end. Come in your power, come in your weakness, in any case, and make all things new. Amen. What I love about this prayer by Walter Brueggemann and what I love about O Holy Night, the carol that we sang this morning, and what I love about our passage today, which is in Isaiah 64, is that all of them hold honest words and tension. And if any of you have lived through 2020... You understand that it has been a dumpster fire full of exciting and joyful times and full of, I don't know what's happening. And so we have experienced in this place that tension, that tension that Walter Brueggemann speaks of in that prayer and that tension that O Holy Night shows us. I mean, a weary soul, as we sang, or in other interpretations, a weary world rejoices, weary and rejoice in the same place, lament and joy, hope and deep despair have been ours this year. And so as we enter into Advent 1, that is this week, if you aren't familiar with what Advent means, Advent simply means expectation, longing, waiting, preparing. And it is the season of the church that starts today, the fourth Sunday before Christmas, and it leads us all the way up into Christmas. It's this time when we remember that Christ came and that he didn't just come um, like a spirit here. He got himself a body and he lived the way we live. And he came into our world and he broke in. And so in this place, we see tension, a world that was waiting for a king, a world that was waiting for a savior, a people who had been thrown out and oppressed, longing for something more. 
And I think that maybe today you could get with me in the longing for something more. Maybe you've experienced actual oppression. Maybe you've experienced actual grief this year and longing. And I think that our Savior understands it. And not just understands it, but he knows. And so as we walk into this today, I want to tell you if you hear nothing else, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to lament. It's okay to not be sure if your smile is fake or if it's real. It's okay. Because Christ invites us to be our authentic selves in this season of waiting and longing and yearning and fighting with all of our might to hold on to hope. Sometimes in the same day, I can hope and despair. I don't know. Can you, can you do that? Can you like up, down? I mean, you know, uh, faith and doubt operate together. Doubt is not a dirty word in faith. It is not a bad word. It is not a bad feeling. It is not a bad thought. It is welcomed by our Savior. Life and death the same day, grace and guilt, rejoicing and lament. Our lives, like this prayer and this song and the scripture we will read, are constantly in tension. And this tension is what Advent is about, this expectancy, this hope, this wonder. And it is this time that I invite you into. The Advent is the season, not only about a baby that was born. It's about the incarnate God bursting into our tense, troubled, mixed bag of a life. And as with the first Advent, we wait, expecting and hoping that Christ will return. Because as we celebrate Christmas, it's not just about looking back. It is about looking forward and saying, Christ, you are coming again. And that is the hope of our glory. That is what we are waiting for. That is what we are hoping for. Every Advent, we hope, we wait, we yearn, we long, and our lives continue. And yet here, for this brief gathering, I want to invite you to reflect and refocus, not on the things that are happening around us, not on the things we've lost, though we will remember them, and not on the things that we have gained, though we will look for them. I invite you to reflect and refocus on really, as cliche as it sounds, the true reason for the season. Christ, our King, our Lord, our Savior, God with us, who on a holy night burst in in the form of a baby in a way that we did not expect, that they did not expect, the hope that one day he will return in a way that we don't expect, to reconcile all things, to renew all of creation, and to draw all people to him. Until that day, we join with all the church and we wait and we expect we doubt and we hope, and dare I say, we lament. A little background on Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9, which is our passage for today. When Isaiah wrote this, when it was written, Israel was in a post-exile life. They had been in Babylon, and before that, uh, they'd been in Babylon, and now they were in exile, and they were bringing back and coming back into the Israel and the temple had not yet been rebuilt. They did not have a place that was centered in worship. This post-exile life is not what they thought it would be. Are we sensing a theme here? Pandemic life is not what we thought it would be. Post-exile life is not what we thought it would be. We had hoped, we had thought, we had longed, we thought that it would be this way. Do you know that this week, today, I was supposed to be in Disney World, that was my plan right? Ryan's turning 40 this year, and we were going to be on a cruise for his birthday. Did we do that? No. Are we going to? No. Life does not look the way it could have, should have. And so we find ourselves in this passage with the Israelites. They are longing for the good old days. They are wanting God to be tangible in a moment when they see they need him. They want him to be present and visible among them again. 
I mean, he led them by a cloud and a pillar of fire. I don't know how much more tangible God could get. If I saw a burning bush in front of me, Moses, I don't know what I would do either. But God was tangible. He, they, they saw him. They moved and went as he called. And now they are lamenting. They are not just sad. Oh, poor us. No, they are weeping and groaning. When it says a weary world rejoices, they're not saying the weary world was like, oh, woohoo. No, they were tired. They're crawling. They're white knuckling themselves to the end. And some of you can feel that. You are white knuckling yourself to 2021. And so they are angry. They're mad. They are demanding. And they are doubting. Been there? Okay, I have. Uh, definitely been angry. And if you haven't learned yet, you can yell at God. That is literally what Isaiah does. He yells at God, and so do the Psalms. So if you need help there, read some Psalms. They're my favorite. That's extra. You guys can keep that. Um, <laughs> they're doubting and they're demanding, and they have hope. It's scrappy hope. Have you ever been there? Where you're like, um, I think that's hope. Let me sweep a little bit up and put it in my pocket right now because I really need it. It's scrappy. It is the type that holds on for dear life, hoping against hope that something will change and something will happen. And so they wait, and so we wait. And they long, and we long. And they doubt, and we doubt. And they weep, and we weep. And they plea, and we plea. And so Isaiah starts this way. Isaiah 64, verse 1 through 9, in the New Living Translation is what I'm reading. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. As the fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways, but you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, they we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore, you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray and see that we are all your people. Woo! Super good Christmas message, right? <laughs> You're like, ooh, she brought it down. <laughs> but can you feel the tension of Advent here? Can you feel the longing for God to do what he had done before? To rend, to tear, to rip open the skies and come down, to show up. Has anyone ever stood anywhere in their house or anywhere in the world and just been like, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing something in this place? Why aren't you moving in my life? I thought it would be this way. Show up. You, God, you alone can put right all that has gone wrong. Get a move on. Do it. Because the world needs to be right again. I feel that pain. I sense that tension in this passage. God, you did it once. Will you do it again? 
Where are you? God, get down here. Show yourself. I need you today. Why are you neglecting us? In verse 7, it says, we know we've sinned. Yet, yet no one calls you. No, sorry. In verse 6, it says, we are all infected and pure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. In verse 7, it says, yet no one calls on your name or pleads for your mercy. Therefore, you have turned us away and turned us over to our sins. We know we've sinned. You've left us to our own devices. What do you expect? This first portion, verses 1 through 7, is a lament, a retelling of what was a remembrance of what had been. Israel is grieving the loss and change in the way that God had, had interacted with them, the way that God had moved amongst them, had been in their presence, and they are longing for it to return. And in verse 8 through 9, this passage turns. It turns on the, the, the words, and yet. And I feel like this Advent, this invitation to expect is a big breath of and yet. And yet. 2020 has sucked. And yet. And yet. And the next words are, O oh Lord. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. This is a reaffirmation that God is the God of Israel. And I want to say to you today that it should be our reaffirmation that Christ is King and Lord of our lives, that He is our God, that He is our Father. I love this, this passage because it says, We are the clay and you are the potter, we are formed by your hand. What does a father do? What does a mother do? They raise children. They form them. Every choice they make as they raise their children is forming that child into who that child will be. The father is patient. The father is loving. The father is kind. And then there's the potter. What does she do? The potter sits at the wheel and carefully, patiently forms beautiful pottery for use, for display, but there's patience there in her hands. And it says that we are formed by God's hands. This part in verse 9, don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are your people. Remember Remember us. This passage is so familiar to me. I identify with it because, again, and I hope that you're hearing this, it feels like our lives. And it's not just 2020. Some of you, 2020 hasn't been that bad. There's a few things that are inconvenient, but you haven't lost a job. You haven't lost friends or family members. There's, there's things that you haven't lost. There are some things that are lost, and I don't diminish those. But some have paid more in 2020 than others. But some of you might say, well, 2018, you don't know what a hell that was. Yeah. Yeah. And so please don't hear that this is all about this year. Please don't hear that this is all about only what happened this year. This is about our lives. This is about your life. And so maybe there's some lament that's still holding on. Maybe there's some things that you have not grieved, that you have not let go of, that you have not released to the Lord or invited him into. And so maybe you're still saying, God, where are you? And maybe, like the rest of us, you're saying that, but for different reasons. This year, we're living in a more divisive time. We're seeing the fruits of our systematic racism and oppression in this world. We are seeing the things we've sown come to fruition. And that is a biblical, that is a biblical thing. That's what happens. The whole of our life is what we reap and sow. It's what we put in and what comes out. And if we are going to sow oppression, 
then we will reap violence. We will reap division. Not to mention our personal losses. I need you to hear this. There are things that have happened that are not just personal this year. They are global and community, and we feel those as well. And we lament for those as well. When Isaiah wrote this, it was not a personal only lament. It was for the whole nation. And when we as a church come together, we can lament together the things we've lost and the things that we hope for and the things that we thought should have been. Perhaps you can feel it too, the grief, the tension, the doubt. Maybe you've put up a tree. Um, I told Hannah yesterday that I thought I understood why she chose carols. She wanted me to listen to Christmas music before December. That's what she wanted. It's not something I usually do, but she needed it. So, <laughs> made her happy. <laughs> but maybe you put up decorations and you think, this will lift me out. This will fix it. This will make the pain and the longing for what was go away. I will feel normal. Or maybe you are just Buddy the Elf and you love Christmas decorations. And that is fine too. But some of us are trying to grasp hold of some sort of normal. And so we do things to grasp onto that. And maybe like Isaiah, you're still calling out in your heart, God, show up. Jesus, where are you? You said you came. You said you're God near. You said you'd be with us. And I don't see. I don't see how you're moving. I don't see how you're working. And so we've put on brave smiles under the mask, of course, and marched on. But inside we feel lost. Or maybe you feel alone or misunderstood. Maybe you feel hopeless or powerless. You long for God to break in and fix it. Could he just erase this year? Could we just, just move forward? But this is Advent. And Advent is the time in the year where we pause just a moment to reflect on what has been. That holy night that holy night when a weary world, they saw this baby and they did not even recognize who he was or what he might be. But shepherds in a field saw angels come down and say, there's great news for all. News of joy and peace and grace. That holy night when the cries of a weary world were met with the cries of an incarnate God. A God who said, I am not just going to rule from away, but I will be with you. I will be God near you. The moment when God showed up in weakness. I mean, what is more helpless than a newborn baby? Anyone? Anyone? Not much else is more helpless than a newborn child. Dependent completely on those around him to care. He showed up and lived a life of suffering so that by his vulnerability, we would know that God is with us, that God knows us, that God loves us, that God has not forsaken us. This is Advent, the time when a world longs for justice and freedom. What does this, the carol say? It says, chains shall he break. It says, in his name, in his name, all oppression shall cease. You see, the scandalous message of Advent is the both and of it. It's the both and of our lives. It's the thing that we can have hope and despair, joy and lament, love and fear faith and doubt, all the same time. <clears throat> what if instead of pretending or trying to just ignore what was and what could have been, the things that we're grieving, what if this year we embrace the message of Advent, the message of this carol, the message of Isaiah, and embrace the tension of lamenting in seasons of joy? The call of O Holy Night to fall on our knees. To fall on our knees with all that was within us. With every part of us. 
the icky bits and the beautiful things, the things that we don't talk about, the thoughts that we never say? What if we, all of us, came? What if all of our authentic selves came before the Lord, fell on our knees, and recognized Christ as King? recognized that the Lord had come, that Christ, the Messiah, the suffering servant, our Lord, in all of the beauty and the mud of this life, came. And we are his people. What if you sat for just a moment and allowed the Spirit to whisper just what you needed to hear? What if you whispered about the things that you're disappointed about, the things that you're hurt by, the things that you had wished for, the things that you had hoped for, the things that should have been? What if you took time to actually pull them out and say, Jesus, I don't love this. I don't like what has happened I don't like that my brothers and sisters are hurting. I don't like what I've lost, and I don't like what I thought would be. Where are you? And what would happen, I believe, is that Christ, our Lord, our Savior, would break through like that whole holy night and say, I am here. I am near. And child, you are mine. I'd like to invite us just to a moment of silence. Because I believe the Spirit wants to speak to you today. I believe Jesus wants to embrace you. I believe the Father wants to just remind you that you are loved. And so I invite you in this moment of silence. If there's something that's heavy, if there's something that's lament-worthy, if there's grief or despair or powerlessness, I just invite you to whisper it back to him. Just tell him about it. Be vulnerable and authentic just with the Lord for this few moments, and then I'm going to pray. Lord, there's a song that says, Oh, great God, be small enough to hear me now. During this Advent season, Jesus, I pray that your spirit would move through our lives, that we would find the ability to lament and rejoice, to hold the tension authentically as ourselves to allow ourselves to be vulnerable to you and to others. I pray, Lord, that in our weariness and in our weakness, your spirit would bolster us. Lord, for those who are grieving, whatever it is that they are grieving, Lord, I pray that you would be near them, that they would sense your tangible presence in their lives and in the lives of others. God, we don't just pray for ourselves, though. We pray for our world. We pray for our nation. We pray for every person that you love, which is everyone. We pray, God, that you would send forth your spirit in this season of Advent, that the weary world would experience Christ our King would experience Emmanuel, God with us, would experience Jesus near. God, help us. God, be near to us. Remember and remind us that we are your people, that you are our father, that you are the potter, 
that Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith, and that Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. first day of a Christmas story here at Village Heights. And we want you to be a part of helping us tell this story. So if you are like me and you like a physical calendar on the fridge, those of you that Leslie, nope, there are printed calendars out in the lobby so that you can follow along the 12 days of Christmas. Day one, today, the giving tree. But then there are other things throughout the, the month of December, random acts of kindness, like uh, write a handwritten note and mail it to somebody, take a treat to a neighbor, do something nice for a delivery person. It's all on this calendar, including the things that are happening here at Village Heights. So we want you to join in telling a Christmas story this year with us. Now, if you are more of a digital person, Go to our Facebook page, the very first post there. You can click on um, either the iCal or the Google Calendar to join that digitally. We'll also be texting you links today. We will be emailing you links today. You can always text us at 281-393-8372 and say, hey, I use Google Calendars. Can you send me a link for that? I use Apple Calendars. Can you send me a link for that? We want you to be a part of this. So whether it's a physical printed copy or a digital copy, join with us in telling a Christmas story. And day one, today. Yes. But now I'm going to add to that. Uh -oh. If you don't think that we have your information, yes. very easy. Fill out a communication envelope, drop it in the box. So we, you can make sure that you are on the receiving list for all yes. this information because we want you to have it. Yes, so give us your the yes. number to text, give us the email that you actually check. Yes. And then if you think they do have my email and I don't get it. Don't give us the junk email. Check your junk box because for some reason MailChimp goes straight to the junk box. I don't know what happened. Some I think you, Brooks Terry sends me to the junk box. I'm not naming names. Some of you got it on lockdown. You, you figured it out. Um, also, magnets are not included. You have to bring your own magnet and put that on your refrigerator, okay? But grab one to put oh, it on your refrigerator calendar. for like, the calendar right there. Magnets. Come got on, it. guys. Come on. Stay with me here. All right. <laughs> here we go. So today, very important. All right. So last year, we probably had about 30 kids. I think this it was 32 year, from 14 families last year. This year, we have... 50, over 50 from kids. From 21 families. From 21 <gasps> families, right? So as Pastor Krista was talking about, the things are, are not so great right now, and some people are suffering, and so they, there's more need, there's more help. Uh, the, we get these from the schools, from Helms and Hogg. Um, yes, Hogg middle school. Middle school, and uh, they send us these families. And so we know that they are in need, and they need our help, and, yeah. and so I need your help. Just yes. what I talked about earlier, audacious generosity, if you haven't practiced it, if you're a little scared of it, this is a perfect opportunity to yes. jump in and practice it. And so you're thinking, I can't take so many kids, and I can't. Here's the cool thing about it. It's not just on you. You don't have to make it just your thing. Mm -hmm. Make it your family's thing. When we go out, so Hannah and I, we'll, we'll grab one, and what we do, or two or three, and, we'll, yeah. and we'll, we'll grab some, and we'll take our kids out. Maybe 10 this year. Or we'll include our family. We'll, we'll message the rest of our family, our cousins, brothers, yeah. sisters, and say, hey, we have these kids. Mm -hmm. We've adopted them for this Christmas to give Sometimes them Sometimes I just send people a picture of a card, and I said, hey, I sponsored this child for you. What gifts are you buying? Yes. I that's, mean, that's not a bad idea. I'm just saying. I don't think it's in Webster's Dictionary yet, but that's called voluntelling. Right. Okay, voluntelling. You're welcome to practice that. Let's mm -hmm. make it a thing. Correct. Um, but really, take it. If your family doesn't live here, that's totally fine. Amazon does a great job of sending that's gifts. Right. So mm -hmm. let them be a part of it. So grab a few names. And if you're thinking, I don't know if I can do this, remember what I said. Cheerfully give. Mm -hmm. 
Be a part of it, and God will make up the difference. You will be surprised. It's not just for Village Heights. It's also for you individually. God takes what you have, and he extends it because it's spreading his message, spreading his love, letting the gospel come through. So, guys, do not leave without talking to Mejon. That's how I say her name, fancy. Her name, it's actually Megan. Megan. It's Megan, but Mejon for those who are fancy. Right. Um, But talk to her, get on the list, grab a name. Right. So logistically, what's going to happen is you go to the tree, you pick out a tag. You can either pick a child's name and it has like their wish list and some things about them on the card. Or if you want to keep it simple and just do gift cards, the gift cards are all hanging on the tree and then on the table are all the kiddos grab a card or 10 and then whichever ones you take that's yours to take put your name on the list so that then i can stalk you later and remind you that i need your presence and on the cards if you're thinking what do i get specifically if there's nothing listed specifically it's kind of up to you yeah however there are a lot of information on those cards for the kids and some of the families are certain gift cards that they would like right so make sure to look at that if you have any questions any at all right email us Text us. Uh, text us. Yeah. Uh, what, call, whatever it may pigeon. be. Carrier pigeon. Th- a smoke signal. Talk to us. We want to yeah. help you make this the best thing that you've done all Christmas yes. season. So. so then, if you have a kiddo, we want you to get two to three gifts. Now, there are some kids out there that have asked for a bicycle. Obviously, we don't expect you to buy 14 gifts and a bicycle. So just kind of feel it out. If they're asking for big stuff, two gifts. If they're asking for smaller stuff, three gifts. Yeah. Wrap them. Tag them with their name. Don't put who it's from. We don't care that it's from you. It's from mom and dad. That's we the want coolest mom thing about and dad this. to be the hero. Yeah, we champion them. So wrap them. it up and just put to little Bill, do not love nobody, nothing. Just put, so we know who it goes to is the only reason why. It's not like the actual gift tag so we can keep them separated and get it to yeah. the right family. Yeah. Then we will take them. We'll, in two weeks, you're going to bring them back wrapped and tagged. We'll take them to the schools, to Helms and to Hog, and we will drop them off. And then mom, dad, grandma, whoever is the adult in the house, will come and pick them up, take them home secretly, put them under the tree, and they get to be the hero. Come on. That is what Christmas is all about. It's not about us. It's about using what God has given us to love others and to spread that joy. If you want to put information on it to help us keep us organized and how we're taking it, just make sure you don't put it permanently on the the present. Make it where we something we can take off. Like, okay, that's the right spot. Mm -hmm. We'll take it off and make sure it's all bundled together. Because once they get to us, we end up, we get those giant Santa bags and we put the whole family in one Santa bag to make it easier, unless it's a bicycle, which is amazing. Um, So we'll we'll keep it organized. If you bring it to us, we'll get it to mom and dad. We promise. And then before you go, the last thing. Last thing. Last right. thing. Here it comes. Even though we have to socially distance and the pandemic is happening, Santa is still coming to the Heights. That's right. right. And, and he's, he's talked to Village Heights, and we're like, yeah, we'll partner with you, Santa. Mm-hmm. We'll make this happen. Yes. So at Marmion Park next Sunday, at what time? 3 to 5 p.m. 3 to 5 p.m. Santa's going to be there in the gazebo. We're going to dress up the gazebo, make it pretty. And so the kids or family or adults or you, whoever or dogs. It, or dogs, whoever it is, can come. They're going to get in the front and Santa's going to make some funny poses or yeah. whatever it may be. I did see somebody walk picture. by last week with a pet parrot. I want the parrot to come. Parrots are also that. welcome. Parrots Any welcome. feathered and furred animals mm-hmm. or non. Uh, just Or furred children. Furred children, whatever yeah. it may be. Bring them. Uh, have them invite your family, invite your friends who live in the Heights, who live in Houston to come be a part of that. Yeah. And there's three things. First, invite people. We mm-hmm. need your help inviting people. Yes. Spread the word. Let people know. It, it's in the Leader uh, uh, magazine this week and, and in, in the email. And in Historic Heights Living magazine. Be in like, so we have Heights local Living publications yes. that are sharing about this. Yeah, they're all sharing it for us. And so... So, someone's excited You're about dead. that. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> yes, historic. Um, <laughs> so, help us share. We're going to put a lot of Facebook, Instagram stuff out there. Share, 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 share. Yeah. Text, you know, get it all out there. Tell, tell your neighbors about it. Um, then also, help us make it happen, right? So, we're going to have to organize this, keep people distant from each other. Come volunteer. Come be a part of it. So, talk to Megan. Text the number. Tell us that you want us to be a part of it. And come volunteer, help us you know, keep it safe and fun environment. Yes. Uh, and the last thing is, if you have kids, be in it. Yeah. If you're not, a, if you're a kid at heart, 
Be in it. Be a part of it. Come take a picture with Santa. Because we'll have, we're inviting everybody to bring their own like cameras or phones or whatever to take their picture yes. so that that way when they leave, they already have what they need yes. to print or post or whatever. Yeah. Um, so just come and it, it's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. And we've had people ask like, why, why does a church care about Santa? Because it's Christmas and our yeah. kids have sacrificed a lot. We've all sacrificed a lot. So let's just do something dumb and fun. Here's but the, safe. The quickest way to someone's heart is to care about something they care about. Oh. Because once they know that oh. you care about them, they'll start caring about you, that's right? It. And we want them to know Jesus. And so that's why we do that. So yeah. help us ultimately spread the gospel by welcoming Santa to the, to the, yes. to the Heights area with them. Yes. We love you guys. Grab a couple kiddos, grab a calendar, yes. subscribe digitally, and we will see you now next don't, week. Don't run over each other now. Nice, nice form fashion. You know, be nice about it, but head on over there. Grab uh, some kids from the tree. We love you guys. Get on it. Yeah.